You just, you know, just, just come up with a, a something, an arbitrary name. Arbitrary name like? Arbitrary <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Welcome to this arbitrary podcast. Oh, I gotta ask you, will you be using your uh, tutorial voice? Uh, probably. You know, the tutorial <laughs> voice, this is a filter, like the microphone has a filter. So everything I speak so on... on an accent. It does, it does. <laughs> Trust me, as soon as you watch this video... Because mine changes as well. <laughs> yes, my... You're gonna sound Scottish by the end of this. <laughs> Welcome to your f***ing podcast. <laughs> Man, you're distorting the microphone. <laughs> okay, uh, so what can the podcast name be? Oh yeah, can we swear? Yeah, of course you can swear. Can swear. I'm gonna have to bleep it out because YouTube is very, very hypersensitive yeah, on this. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I will, okay, I will so do it. Don't you're... worry about it. Okay. I will edit okay. it. I'll try not to. Detail. I'll try not to. No, you don't have to not try not to. Okay. <laughs> I mean... You know, like, I say <laughs> sh- Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Like, I have to censor that out, but... Yeah. The more you oh. do it, the more work okay. I have to do. I know, that's... that's uh... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my podcast. Beep! <laughs> Beep! <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> so how can we start it? Like, the whole point of this channel, let's say, has been for Android development so far. Okay. And it's yeah. going to continue down the Android development line because uh, that, that'll be a later question about uh, multi-platforming and programming for multi-platforms. Okay. But it's mostly Android development, and I know you are a multi-platform kind of guy. You I use C Sharp, which yeah, is great. Experience, I guess. A little bit. Here and there, yeah. You still watch my tutorials, so I'm I watch your convinced. tutorials. So I'm, I'm like <laughs> level zero right here. How's the, how's your Kotlin programming going? Did you learn anything about Kotlin? I'm not following along code for code, but I'm 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 a consistent viewer. Are, are you jealous about the Kotlin programming language? No, <laughs> <laughs> I have no jealousy towards it. I, I just I, yeah. An ambivalent, huh? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start the podcast? <laughs> You're the host. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you okay, let me try. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of, I feel kind of embarrassed saying, like, uh, make, creating an intro in front of you. Yeah. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our first podcast. I'm here with Ivan Spilich. Is that how you say it? Spilich. Spilich. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's going to explain who he is. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, well, I'm currently a student. Uh, I'm doing a master's in uh, computer science. Um, I have a, a bachelor in software development. I have some... Uh, experience uh, in uh, in programming some professional experience I worked as a uh, I worked on various projects uh, I developed apps I worked with databases uh, back-end development uh, yeah so a what, bit of this and that what kind of programs do you make and what kind of language do you use uh, well back then uh, at work at least uh, it was mainly C sharp mm. uh, it was actually both for uh, app development and uh, all the back-end work that we did uh, for the for the back-end work uh, the C sharp was compiled uh, natively it was just .NET running on Windows but uh, for our applications it was uh, we actually used a framework called Xamarin um, which you know lets you compile uh, both to uh, iOS and Android yeah, devices yeah. so yeah that's Mainly C sharp, some JavaScript, of course, if it's some front end stuff. But yeah, mainly C sharp. I hope one day you can teach me a little bit about HTML and JavaScript. Oh yeah, it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it really? I, I mean, yeah. I, you know what? Actually, honestly, uh, I do like JavaScript. Do you find a it like lot. a relief when you program in C sharp so much <clears throat> to use these other programs? I really like C sharp because uh, it. I feel like C sharp was uh, kind of like they took everything that was great about Java, and yeah. then they just added some things that Java was missing. That sounds exactly like Kotlin. Oh yeah, <laughs> compared to Java as well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I see that. But like, otherwise, you know, C Sharp and Java are pretty much sister languages. So yeah. It's not, like, you can read them interchangeably almost, right? You can, like, if, right if, you, if you, yeah, I mean, if you have experience with one, you'll know the other. Like, there's very tiny differences uh, in some keywords. Um, there's some things where I, I feel like C Sharp is much more flexible, um, but that's, of course, it came a little bit later. Uh, so that's that's normal. All right, and now we're gonna move on to our next question is, what got yes. you into programming? <laughs> oh, yes, uh, so there's uh, there's some story time here. <laughs> Good, let's hear the story. Um, so, uh, as a kid, uh, I, my dad had a laptop, usually like a work laptop, 
that he'd bring home. And I didn't have a lot of games to play on. Like, usually I'd either play, you know, uh, Minesweeper or Solitaire or something. The very best. Yeah, the, the very best. The very best of the best. Uh, and um, the thing is, you know, eventually you can only do so much of Minesweeper as a kid. You can't really stick to one thing. You got to kind of explore. Uh, I had a curiosity that made me want to explore around the system a little bit, you know, the computer. Like, how does it work? Why does it do the things it does? And so on. Um, and I remember uh, as I as I grew older, as I uh, started school, and as we um, started messing around in the computer lab, uh, you know, all the kids started pranking each other with those batch programs. Like, you know, you'd make like a script where uh, uh, the computer would just keep opening uh, different CMDs, like the consoles, that yeah, keep yeah, opening yeah. other consoles, and then we'd keep trolling each other with these programs until, you know, someone's computer crashed and, <laughs> and burned, basically. Uh, so that was, I, I kind of started out then, it was just like a curiosity thing, like, hey, you know, a little bit of scripting. I didn't really think of it as something that I wanted to do at the time, um, but it, it seemed a lot like a lot of fun. Um, but it wasn't until a little bit later, I was around 11 or 12, uh, when my dad introduced me to uh, a programming language called BASIC. Um, I do believe that it is also a Microsoft language, but I'm, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, it is an older language. Um, he showed me a version of it called Just Basic, um, which was kind of like a, you download a, an IDE and you get this interpreter with it that would just run this basic uh, code for you. And the thing is that it came with like pre-made, you know, graphical uh, libraries. So you could do cool things like draw fractals and make windows and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but he showed me like, uh, you know, the basics of the basics. Like what does, how do you print stuff to the console? How do you, you know, how do you add numbers together? You know, stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of where I started, um, you know, doing like very small things, making very simple games. Uh, do you know what a Do you know what a Hilo game is? No, I've never heard of it. <clears throat> it's where you It's where you make the computer come up with a number. Ah, uh, yeah, I created that game as well. Oh yeah, it's one of the basic. You created games. the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I put it on an Android <laughs> application because that's what like st schools try to right, encourage. Right. Yeah, because it, it's a very simple logic game and. and it's a lot of fun, like, because you, you play around with random things and you actually get to experience playing a game that you made. Mine was very harsh because it insulted you every time you guessed the wrong number. Ah. <laughs> and then once you got the right number, uh, it still insulted you for getting it so I late. see. Yeah. So you made, like, a hostile kind of... <laughs> I mean, like, you're awful at guessing and you should know it. <laughs> mm, right. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was kind of like that. So I kept, uh, you know, playing around with uh, just basic for a while. And I ended up getting kind of good at it. And by good at it, I mean, I, I think that was like the first language that I learned, like the basics of, <laughs> to make it punny. No, but I, please, I please learned, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of learned, you know, how things work, like the syntax, um, you know, why you do the things that you do. Um, I know that eventually I made a, we, we used to play a lot of uh, Yahtzee with my family. And uh, I ended up making a a graphical program with where where it would make the whole Yahtzee board for you. No. And yeah, and and then uh, <laughs> it would also have like two random dice that it would roll for you, and then you could you know play by the numbers and you could select on the board, uh, you know you play Yahtzee essentially. And was it on a <clears throat> mobile phone or on a computer? No, it was all it was actually all within the IDE, so it would run interpreted. But the thing is that you could export EXE programs, so you could actually give people standalone applications wow. uh, once you wanted to, you know, compile them. Um, so that was, it was a great little program. I actually don't know if uh, um, it's still available because I only thought of it like yesterday. Uh, and this is like many, many years later. Um, but yeah, what ended up I actually eventually I lost that um, application. I felt really sad because I couldn't find like the code for it and. I know that I did a lot of work for it, and my dad was like very proud too. He saw that like, oh yeah, like you actually managed to make this, and it was really good because, you know, I worked out all the bugs and I worked out all the kinks and things, and like, okay, it it, it works now. It's an actual application. And then uh, he was also sad when when we couldn't find it anymore, <laughs> so that bummed me out too. Um, but as I grew older and I and I uh, got into eighth and ninth grade, I kind of 
stopped programming. I didn't I didn't get into it uh, so much. Um, and then I don't know why or how I um, in the in the first year of high school. No, I know why. Um, in the first year of high school, I got my own laptop for the first time. Is it this one? <laughs> it's not this one. It's not this one. Um, and this is like three laptops ago, maybe. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so I, I got my own laptop and I was like, okay, I can do anything, right? I, you know, the first thing you do is like, all right, I can change the you know, the backgrounds. I can change the colors of things. You it's got gonna full be, control. Full control. I, I have full control. Of the, I'm the system administrator, right? No, but I, I realized that I wanted to kind of play around with the system again. And that's when I got into Batch again from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, I started setting up little uh, automated jobs for me, you know, move some files around or do some scheduled tasks for me. And that felt really good because, you know, I would code the program and it would actually do something useful for me. Um, so I was, I was playing around with Batch. Um, and then I encountered a lovely man uh, by the name of Bucky. I forget his last name. His, his YouTube channel is called The New Boston. And he had this, like, way back in the day, this is like 2011, 2010, 2011, he had a series, probably still does, um, he actually has a couple, a few series mm. on Java. Um, and it was beginner, intermediate, and I think a hard or, a, or like a professional level. <clears throat> My channel. And, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I ended up watching this man's entire Java series because he, he was such a good teacher. Like, it was so good at teaching, and it inspired, you know, the whole series inspired me again, and the applications that he made inspired me to, uh, you know, mess around in Java code. And I was like, wow, this is really cool, you know, I can do a lot of stuff. Um, I got sold with the whole idea of, you know, Java runs everywhere. Like, you can write it, and, you know, it, it'll run on your freaking credit card for all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so that intrigued me, and I, and I loved using Java, because I could see that it was, it was a powerful language. Um, and then eventually I uh, met some friends in high school and we found out rather coincidentally that uh, we were programming in our free time, like all of us. <laughs> uh, so that was really coincidentally. cool. Coincidentally. Yeah, it was, it was a coincidence because <laughs> uh, one day my friend mentioned that uh, he, was, he was making some game in, in Python. And uh, I was like, well, what do you mean, like, making a game? And he said, like, yeah, yeah, he's, like, coding everything. And he, he shows me on his laptop. He's got this, like, he's got so many lines of code. Like, I'd never written anything like that in my life. And, you know, he has this game, and it's buggy as hell, and there's a little character running around, and we're laughing because it crashes every now and then. And, it, like, it's cool. You know, he made his thing, and I was like, wow, like, I'm, you know, I'm doing code in Java. Like maybe we can, you know, work together. Wow, you know, and everyone was like, "Isn't this where people clash?" This, this, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like Python it, versus Java. It's true. Like, what are we going to use? <laughs> nah, but it was, it was really funny because we didn't know that we were coding, but it was a new thing that we had in common and that we could talk about. You know, um, so that helps when you have a like a like a community or some kind of. Uh, friend, uh, social circle, something that does share the same passion, because then you feel even more passionate. You belong. Person. Yeah. Um, so that kind of reignited the whole, uh, I'm going to go into programming thing, and that kind of just stuck uh, for me through high school. Um, and then I, yeah, I applied for university, and that's that's that. You found you found what you needed to do. I guess, yeah. I'm st I'm still trying to find that. To be fair, I, a lot of a majority of people. Yeah, I'm, possibly. I'm, are. I'm, you know, I can see that I'm definitely into more theoretical things. Uh, but yeah, software or programming is definitely an in, in, in interest. You have so many opportunities at that. Right. And you can create what you want if you have yeah. the imagination. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting as well because the first time I met you, I like I, I didn't care about programming at all. Yeah. I didn't do anything regarding it. I mean, I was just doing graphic design. Mm. And then, like one random day later, I thought, Evan looks like someone that probably codes. <laughs> and no one ever told me before that you were a programmer. Max never told me. Uh, no one else that knows Max told me. And I just asked you at that party one day, yeah. like, do you do programming? And I told I, you about it. Like, you do what I really want to do. <laughs> So I was oh. like, that was perfect. And just as you went to your story, like my small community of programmers is slowly right, growing. Right, yeah. You're the only one at the moment, but sure, like yeah. it's slowly growing. I mean, mm. I've got all my thousand fans on YouTube in the future. <laughs> 10,000. 10,000, at least 10,000. Yeah. But I'm just glad I can start creating this community right, as well. Yeah, yeah. 
you're always there for questions even though you don't answer them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, just, all right. just like dig deeper into the documentation. <laughs> I mean, sure. No, I, but the, what you, the answers you give me are pretty good. All right. I just have to look into the resources you sent me. Right, right. There's also like, it goes only as far, like programming is as much as it is uh, an engineering, uh, a technological uh, practice, it is also an art in the sense that you have to keep doing it to learn. Uh, so it doesn't really pay off for me to, you know, send you code for a, for a problem that you might You never want. sent me code. No, anyway. no, that, that's the but thing. But I, I understand what you say. If, if you find out how to solve it, it's much better. Right. And I think it always helps, like, hey, maybe I can just direct you in here instead of just, you know, telling you, hey, it's this. Luckily in Java, you know, Kotlin is exactly the same language, essentially. Mm. You can copy Java and paste it in on uh, Kotlin and it just compiles it. Okay. And okay. translates it. Mm. If only they could do that for the other languages. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. All right, <clears throat> so moving on. Describe as like an average day, what is your daily life as a programmer? Daily life as a programmer. So uh, the <laughs> there's the professional life where, uh, you know, I, I had a full-time job. I worked as a developer um, and that was obviously, you know, a, a eight to four kind of thing. Well, not really. Like you, you worked on tasks. Um, like I, I wouldn't want to leave, you know, if I was in the middle of something because it sucks, you know, finishing off the day with an You can't even go to sleep half you the time. No. Um, but the thing is that it would be a full day's work um, of usually code, um, but also like meetings and organization. Because obviously, in, in when it comes to software development as a, as a, a practice, um, in a professional environment, you have to cooperate, you have to learn to work in, as a team, you have to cooperate with your colleagues, and you have to know how to well, combine not just different ideas, but also down to the practical level, like you have to know how to combine the code together. You know, there's there's methods for that. There's interfaces, you know, stuff like that. Um, but you have to agree on these things. And there's oftentimes the relatively boring uh, aspect of having a lot of meetings. And company meetings are not that much fun, um, especially when, uh, you know, comes to just basic organization like i don't really care what everyone else has to do as long as you know it, it comes to me and then if the boss says okay like this is what we want to do i want you guys working on this okay i get it. the meaning makes sense but um sometimes oftentimes for me at least it would be kind of boring i think a lot of people who have been to meetings will understand what i mean um but sometimes you have meetings that are about cracking a problem so like if you do have a bug in some old software or whatever that you inherited um, and no one knows how to fix it, like, all right, you got to sometimes sit down, you know, get a whiteboard, figure out what's going on. And that can be fun because that's kind of like solving a puzzle. Have you seen my two whiteboards? I have actually seen your two whiteboards. I really like it. I really like this one too. Thank you. Because you're like, it looks like you're very organized. Thanks. And this one is, this one is coming up. So. It's empty because I move everything onto one whiteboard. Right. Okay. <laughs> all right. But it looks neat. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but then, then there's the, um, so apart from the coding in, the, in a professional environment, right? Obviously you do a lot of work, you do a lot of debugging, you mm. do a lot. Of, so sometimes you'll <laughs> literally wake up and you'll figure the problem out. You know, that's kind of thing. And then you show up at work and I'm like, okay. <laughs> but that <laughs> this is, is what I gotta... such a great feeling. It happened to it me is. the other day. I was just mm. walking and I thought like, <laughs> it was a bug that I knew was in my program, but I didn't experience yet. Oh, okay. And I just realized how to fix it as I was walking. That's that's amazing. It's just such a good realization. Yeah. And then I tried to fix it, and I created three more bugs. <laughs> yes, that is also how it works. <laughs> Welcome to the to the field. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, but then the, the I think the second category in the daily life of a programmer would be you know the hobbyist category. Like if you don't have a job, if you're either a student or whatever, uh, if you if you're just working on your own projects, then like really it's up to you. Like you, you are your own boss. Um, you get to decide what you want to work on, how sure. long you want to spend on it. Uh, I mean, you know the drill, right? Right. You, you come up with your own ideas sure. and you filter out a lot of them, I presume. <laughs> some of them are not great. Some of them are great. Um, you put up only the great ones, of course. Of course, only the great ones, not the easy ones, the great yeah. ones. <laughs> um, but yeah, like that's, that's essentially what you do. You don't really have to follow any guidelines. Um, the great thing about programming is that as long as you have an interest in it, 
uh, anyone can do it because it really is easy today, especially, right? With the modern languages and everything, and it, the documentation. Yeah, but I mean more like like yeah. everyone has a computer. Sure. Like you can just get started. Like you can just download something. And you can get started with anything. And then the next part is how long did it take you to get comfortable with programming? <laughs> Um, Are you comfortable with programming today? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I, could like I could read that in your face. I don't like it. I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in a nutshell, I think a few years. But honestly, like my, because my story is that I started. Actually, I started when I was young, and that that was that was a great thing because it's it was possible for me. But I didn't stick to it as religiously as I should have. Yes. And that is very important because, uh, as I said, it's a lot of programming is about practicing and just sticking to it. And, and you know, you got to keep going at it. That's how you learn it. You can't you can't just memorize it. And exactly. Write code. Um, so that's you know that that's once you master the idea of sitting down patiently in front of your machine and really spending most of the time debugging your trash <laughs> you know once you're comfortable with that you, i think you can you can say that you're comfortable with programming yeah that would kind of be my my answer but yeah for me personally it was a few years and i don't think that it takes a few years i think that's an important point to make was that like a comfortable uh, growing curve learning curve I mean, or, it, it wasn't when I got into it. Uh, as I said, um, that YouTube channel, The New Boston, I'm going to plug it again. Uh, but yeah, it, it really helped me out, right? I found a series. I mean, if you know, find whatever you want. The point is you can find whatever you want to follow and then you stick to it. And there are so many good tutorials out there. There really are. Yeah. And then there are mine. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, in, you're in the good category. I'm getting up there. I, I, see, the, I see the effort. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, so for me personally, it was a few years, but it is important uh, to say that it doesn't have to take a few years. It doesn't take a few years. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, what are your goals in programming? My goals in programming? The only thing that comes to mind, it's kind of a, a broad question, but the only thing that comes to mind for me is that um, I try to be as good of a, a coder as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, by that, I mean I try to write the best possible code. <clears throat> and this is especially important uh, for, you know, not just large systems, but systems that uh, you share with other people, systems that you have to maintain for a long time. You know, there's certain developmental practices that you should respect. Because um, if everyone wrote trash code, the world would really suck. And I know, I know today there's a lot of legacy software that people have to maintain, and it is trash code. I apologize in advance. <laughs> right, right. We, we all apologize. The new generation of programmers apologizes for when we hit the market. Forgive us. Right, okay. Um, but yeah, so like, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a broad question, but I feel like for me, <clears throat> it was always about finding out little quirks or, or figuring out a really cool way to solve a problem or Intuitive making code engine, yeah. yeah like making making code look you know really smart instead of just let's write it and see if it runs kind of thing yeah you know? would you describe your code as very legible legible um could uh, like a random c sharp programmer well, in your field understand your code I, without an explanation i would i get you know i in my experience i only had to i did have to give my when i was quitting my job mm -hmm. i i did have to give my uh, i did have to go through my projects with someone yeah. someone who was going to inherit my stuff and i don't know if they were being you know just nice modest. or whatever <laughs> or modest or something but they said like man i'm so happy like i'm inheriting your code like it's uh, definitely going to reset it yes yeah, um, <laughs> but I, I, I got told that at least compared to what they've seen before, it was, it was better. So that I was fine with that. Um, obviously, a lot of people have different um, practices, like they have different preferences. They have different pref ways of handling variables, you know, different ways of making loops and things run together. It's fine. Naming conventions. Naming conventions especially, and that's actually something that um, serious businesses uh, work on clearing out before projects are started. That so you have to, amazing. Yeah, so you actually have to standardize and agree on uh, you know what you want to name all the variables, what you want to, how you want to split up the methods and stuff like that. 
So yeah, I, I don't think I, I can't I can't be that arrogant. I can't say that I write great code. I obviously sometimes feel like I do, but I know that most of the time I don't. Um, so yeah, that's <laughs> very, very modest from uh, uh, Ivan. <laughs> All right, and for the next question, that's kind of related. That you said you had a trouble kind of understanding. Oh yeah, okay. was uh, writing code that you don't understand, but think in theory it should just work. Like uh, you wrote it down, you don't really know what you did, but you know it will give you the right answer. I uh, so has that happened to you? No. So the, <laughs> so the first, and that's the end of the I, podcast. <laughs> that is the end of the podcast. The first thing that comes to my mind, you mentioned this the other day, and the first thing that came to my mind was like, wait, you have to be some fucking genius. Because I have personally never experienced this in my life. I like it, to, for me, I always had, you know, the very cliche kind of. You write some code, yep. you think it has to work, but it just doesn't. It just <laughs> fucking doesn't. And you're instead of the opposite way around. Exactly. And you're sitting there and you're killing yourself and you hate it and you hate the computer, but you know it's your fault because yeah. <laughs> it can't be the computer's fault. It's the monkey sitting behind the screen, right? And it, it's uh, right. So that's never happened to me. So I'm. Actually, I'm really curious <laughs> to find out how does that work? You know, what, what goes on in your head? <laughs> Essentially, like, you know, you know all the formulas that give you the answer and you put them all together, but you just didn't plan it out. You just put all the formulas. That sounds fucking genius. Thank you, but it was a very simple program. <laughs> <laughs> have, you seen the, um, have you seen the movie called The Man Who Knew Infinity? No. It is a movie about an Indian mathematician called Ramanujan. Um, he lived, oof, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I think it was in the 19th century. Hmm. I think it had to be the 19th century. And he was an Indian mathematician. The interesting thing about him was that he developed um, all these calculations and formulas in India without having had any prior education. So this man was able to, like you said, he was able to just come up with theories and things like ridiculously abstract theories. Today, some of his formulas, just to put it into context, yep. today some of his formulas are used for black hole calculations and stuff like that. Like it's ridiculous mathematics. He was able to, you know, literally, you know, draw it in sand or, or on walls or whatever. And it, when he eventually um, got in touch uh, with the British back up because uh, at that point India was still British yeah. blah, blah, and he eventually got into touch in touch with um, oh I think it was Oxford I can't remember which year, but it was like a really prestigious university anyway one of, one of the Oxbridge okay right? okay <laughs> um, and he got into touch with a I think it was the head of mathematics over there and he got invited to go to England to study at the university everything paid for he essentially got a scholarship and like without having had any prior education be simply because of the sample of work that he sent and they ended up develop the whole movie is about it's the same it's, it's he's played by the same guy that uh, acted in slumdog millionaire i haven't seen it oh you haven't seen slumdog millionaire i haven't seen any <laughs> movies we talked about this okay. last time <laughs> all right sure um, anyway a great actor it's a great movie i do recommend it um uh, but yeah, he, he ends up working with this head of math. Um, the issue with mathematics is, right, and actually a lot of computer science, you'll come to see, especially on a theoretical level, they're very much the same, um, is that in order to verify the correctness or the truth of something, you have to prove it. You can't just say that this is the formula, this is true. And that was actually Ramanujan's problem. Um, and in the movie, they, um, there's a great scene where they're reviewing his work, you know, he's opening these books and these mathematicians are all amazed at these calculations that he has. Um, and, and one of the guys asks him, like, how, how do you come up with these things? You know, you've never had any schooling. How, do you, how does this happen for you? Yeah. And he answers just, you know, it's God. He got these ideas in his head. He didn't, he didn't develop them, you know, he didn't follow an algorithm or another formula to come up with something. He, he literally just got just popped up. Yeah. And then he wrote them down and they were true. Like they ended up proving him in the, in the end. And as I said, a lot of Ramanujan's work today is used, especially in physics and stuff. Um, and it, just to continue the story, it's kind of a sad story because he ends up getting uh, sick on the, I think on the journey home or 
right at the end of his study. Something, something like that. Um, and he ends up dying of the sickness. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but yeah, kind of a sad story, but a brilliant man um, that worked exactly the same way you do, apparently. Wow, <laughs> I feel so honored. And you put it that way, I feel very honored. Yeah, because it just reminded me, like, wow, how can you just, like, you just get this idea in your head, you get the code, and then you just write it down, and you don't know why, but it works. I, I wrote it, I looked at it, I didn't understand it, yeah. but it worked. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant, that's absolutely brilliant to me. So yeah, I, I can't say that I've uh, had that happen to me. <laughs> it will happen, mm. hopefully. Hopefully not. It's I, it's nicer when you understand what you write, but I it could be like a it nice is push. Nice you can explain it and teach it to someone else. But I, I do have to admire this because it does sound brilliant. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Maybe I, you can show me some examples. I will try to find an, a real life example later because yeah. maybe it's not that impressive once I show you that it's just uh, like well, yeah, we'll I guess see. the number. I'm not gonna judge. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and now a very closely related question, or maybe not that closely related, but at what point would you give up on your code because you just uh, had too many bugs or oh yeah, that okay. you just knew it was trash and you had to restart it from scratch? Um, so yeah, this one also for me splits into two categories. It splits into the professional work and the work you do at home. Uh, and by home, I mean as a hobby. Um, Professionally, sometimes you don't get to make these choices. Um, there are certain time constraints. You got to deliver your um, solutions to clients, and code refactoring takes a lot of time. Yes. And the thing with refactoring is that it's not new content that's being developed or new solutions that are being made, um, which is what the business wants to pay you for. Um, code refactoring is more for the sake of it's it's kind of like meta functional work okay because you're not adding new stuff you're trying to just improve on what you have and the problem with the idea is when it comes to running a business is that clients only pay you for the features that you promised okay uh, <clears throat> so that so the problem there is if you do refactor at work uh, you are kind of wasting money in some people's ideas. But, but the thing is, you have to understand that if you do have a great boss who, who knows um, the concepts behind cleaning up code bases and maybe optimizing the work, then um, he'll also understand things like, or he, he or she will also understand things like um, the investment of time. So like if, if you want to clean up code, usually it's going to be to help you out in the future. Yeah. Um, and some people understand it and it's great, especially, you know, if you have a boss that is also a developer, they'll understand this is going to help us in the long run. We'll still get paid. You know, maybe we can do more things because we just liberated a lot of time. But usually what happens is that bosses have a hard time understanding that. Um, so at work, you'll, you might find yourself um, kind of stuck working with the same thing over and over again and just kind of maintaining and patching up things here and there. Um, and I know this, I'm currently involved in a, in a, in a, I guess a redesign, more of an architectural redesign, not really a code based redesign uh, of a project at a real company for my, um, semester project. Mm. Uh, at, at school. Um, so yeah, there's very nasty examples of how people have just, you know, added patches on patches on patches of code for years. And I, in this case, it's literally, I think, 10 years now or more. Um, and it's gross. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare touch that. And I, I would never even dare have something like that uh, personally, you know, for me at home as a hobby. Like, I find that disgusting. But they do not let you <laughs> reset it, right? They want no, you so, to so maintain the, it. Yeah, so the problem right there is that there's, you know, the, the, the boss knows that uh, there was an opportunity for refactoring this back in the day or maybe changing up some developmental methodologies from the start. Because now, 10 years later, after patching and patching and patching and just writing let's say shitty code, um, you get into the problem where if you want to rework code, which you desperately need to do, you're going to have to spend a substantial amount of time not developing new features for clients. And that's actually very dangerous. It's kind of like a dangerous place for a business to be, especially a business that uh, finds itself kind of surviving. Yeah. 
off new features like it needs new clients to try and get new you know money for of course. for maintaining the developers and ma then the developers maintain the system and so on um, so that can, that isn't always possible but at home um, if you're working on something personally that is entirely up to you like that is the best thing about working on like home projects you're your own boss and uh, you get to choose uh, when you want to refactor code. Um, I know personally, uh, when I was making little games here and there, working on websites and things, um, I was doing things um, in order to learn a language or learn some new functionalities that they add in some new versions, for example. Um, and the thing with that was, when you want to get better at a language uh, and you realize that, hey, this code could be written better, then you should write it better because uh, because that's the whole point yeah right uh, so I had that happen to me a lot I'd look at something and I'm like ah, this is this isn't the way I want this you know ah, and then I just scrap it and I just write from scratch so it, it sounds kind of crazy it sounds maniacal right <laughs> but it, it's 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 cool because it helped me well first of all you get to you know get back into the whole drilling thing you get back into the routine you got to write some things you learn yeah. Um, but you also get to learn doing things in a better way because that was the whole point. So again, professionally, you might not always be there. If you do get the chance, if you are able to um, sell the idea to your boss, great. That's amazing. Because uh, working, you know, in the long run with systems that are maintainable in that way, that are organized, is far better than systems that are shit. And I have worked on both, so I, like I really do know. You've got a vast experience, yeah. Oh, vast is yeah. I wouldn't say vast, but I, I've seen I've seen both sides of that cookie. Let's, <laughs> let's say, yeah, the burnt side and yeah. What do you hate about programming? What do I hate about programming? Uh, something maybe you wish that didn't exist in programming, <laughs> or <laughs> that didn't exist. I. I don't hate, I, I don't ever find myself hating code, and I, especially today I find myself a lot more patient just because I've been to hell and back. You've experienced <laughs> it. I've experienced it, I've seen it, I, I, I know the feelings, so it's, I, I haven't been hit with something I haven't felt before. Right. And that's great. So, you know, PTSD, maybe, but <laughs> otherwise I'm pulling through. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you don't have too many problems with programming. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, like say, I hate yeah. looking at the screen or I hate the lines of code. Mm. I hate C sharp. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I putting it that way, um, I think there may be like some languages that I just don't like, like the syntax. Examples? Oh, um, I don't know. You don't have any? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, now, like you know, when you're like reading an article on Wikipedia, you're, you're on the going spot or something, and, yeah. and you they give you they, very nice. They give you like all these examples in a few different languages, and sometimes there's just gonna be some ugly garbage there. Like it looks so bad. Like why did they make it that way? <laughs> the nice yeah, example. Sometimes huh? I just think that to myself. Like why did you have to make this? I, I can't really. I know that there's esoteric languages, but esoteric languages, that's kind of the point. Like, you want to make them hard. Like, brain fuck. I don't know if you can say that. With lo I will censor it out. All right, but, but brain <laughs> fuck, that's the name of the language. Like, it's, ah, then if it's the name of the language, it's fine. Well, <laughs> all right. Um, but that's the whole point, right? The language is supposed to it's look just hard. It's pure boilerplate code? No, the, the oh. point is that it's made up of, like, pluses and minuses and things like that. Like, it, it's a few, I think it's eight characters or something that you can use to write all the code. Like, it's very interesting, and it's written as a more ah. of a puzzle or an exercise by, you know, a computer scientist or a programmer or something, um, rather than a language that's meant to be used. So it's the computer language almost. Well, like almost. a step above Actually, it. I think you are right, because they do make challenges for, like, interpreters and things for brain f But that's another whole, that's a whole story. Uh, the thing is, those languages are excused. Like, they're supposed to be stupid. Stupid, I mean syntactically. Fair enough, fair enough. And with that, we conclude the normal questions. Oh, yes. Now comes the more fun <laughs> questions, which are almost the same. I can, uh, I can get rid of my notes here. Just, <laughs> just take away your notes. You need a okay. fresh mind, a fresh, a fresh mind. slate for the final I have never questions. programmed ever. Okay. <laughs> I'm a clean slate. How many All right. Wait, how many of these? We have four questions. Four of these. Four mystery questions. <laughs> but I don't think you'll be okay. able to respond to them for too long. 
Fair enough. Because the first one yeah. has nothing to do with anything besides what you wrote to me about a month ago. Oh, Who fuck. do you think is the next Bill Gates? Oh, fuck me. <laughs> you brought this Honestly, upon yourself. You I, asked. Didn't, I, I, I have to say, this wasn't even a conversation. This was just like a, like a, like a little joke thing. And you asked for it. And I told you, I think it was it was in the context of you being the next Bill Gates. I guess I'm the next Bill Gates then. I guess you are the next Bill Gates. I honestly, I don't know. I... The thing with Bill Gates, the thing that's so great about him, that he, you know, as... He created your IDE and... <laughs> he's he responsible. Let, he lets you use C Sharp. <laughs> he's responsible for a lot of great things to me. I don't want to, you know, get on the political side of things. It's just... Um, a lot of the things that we do use and do like and take for granted. It's because right? of him. It's because of him. I think that's that carries a certain weight. Um, but I don't know. Like, you know, as the as the industry moved forward in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, like he was there. He was kind of revolutionizing. He was kind of doing the same thing. You know, Steve Jobs was doing for his thing. You know, the whole idea of user experience and stuff like that for Apple. And I think that's great. I, I just, I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a business visionary like no. he is, so it's very hard for me to say like, oh, yeah, like this guy, you know, or Elon I saw the Musk potential. or something or something. You know, like, <laughs> like no, I really don't know who the next Bill Gates is. It's fair enough. I mean, yeah. this well, question... I'll just say, for the sake of officially uh, answering the question, it would be uh, Federico. Nice, <laughs> nice. Now, as you heard it here live from Elon. Yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, now we can move on to the real questions again. Oh, the real questions! <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. This one's more of like uh, I don't know. You can brainstorm it. Who's the like. next Steve Jobs? <laughs> the next Steve Jobs. That was, that's <laughs> exactly the next question. All right. No, it's yeah. not that one. If you could create any app, what kind of app would you create? Fuck. Uh, you can create any app, but what? Like, of I course, can. that's the thing. That's the <laughs> the thing. thing is now you're gonna have to give away an idea. Uh, exactly. So think of one that you don't have the patience to make ever. So you're happy to give away. I, I don't know if I have the patience. I just the thing that comes to mind is um, what kind of app do you wish existed right now? I. This person, I read a comment on Reddit somewhere, which I really liked, yeah. it was like, every time you take something from the fridge, yeah. like, um, I don't know, carrots, and you run out of carrots, let's say, or milk, like, the, the, the fridge places an order for you. Ah, yeah. And yeah. then you just get it. Right. Okay. I really like that idea. Mm. But I think that's technology more than an app. It is technology, and it's a lot of uh, security concerns once you start doing the whole Internet of Things concept. Like, you don't want people hacking your fridge and ordering... Milk and milk and milk and milk. It's not already possible. <laughs> <laughs> right, so like it would suck if you got a hacked fridge and you just someone just ordered like a bunch of mushrooms for you or something that you don't like. And it goes to someone else, or no? It still comes that to you. It would still come to you, but you'd get, cr you know, like you could, you know, like I wouldn't want someone hacking my toilet or something like that. You know what I mean? So like, it keeps on flushing, huh? right? <laughs> exactly. You know, whatever, whatever the application. <laughs> like someone hacks your thermostat. In the house, and it's always hot. <laughs> f that. Like I, I f***ing kill myself. Like that's so annoying. So there's, that's already possible, isn't it? I don't. Know. But the thing is, it's it's a great <laughs> cool. security is a great concern in, in internet things like that. Once you start connecting things to the outside world, you have to make sure that it's only you who can, you know, request things from the outside world, not anyone else that can do it for you. So. Fair enough. Yeah. I didn't know you were so terrified of technology. <laughs> okay, sure, we, like, we can put it that way. Like it's a, what do they There's call it? There's a healthy dose of skepticism with some things that one must have. As a programmer, the one thing I fear most is programming itself. Exactly. <laughs> I've seen it and I don't want to do anything. Like yeah. What do you think about AI that creates code for you? Uh, is that being developed? Do you, anything, do you know anything about it? Um, or what do you think about that concept? So. There's the the field of um, automatic code generation is actually also a very tough science because mm. um, it relates to you know obviously you want to generate correct code you don't just want to generate things at random and yeah. try and compile uh, it turns out that it's a very difficult problem in computer science to put in a bunch of requirements into a system and then tra have the system translate them into algorithms. Yeah. Um, so the whole point with AI trying to do, like, 
I don't think we're the, I don't know of anything uh, that can do that yet. I don't think we're there yet. Um, where an AI makes algorithms, I, I'm not going to go into the whole thing whether it's dangerous or not. You know, a lot of people. No, that's for another time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, it it might be doable in the future, and it's certainly the next step. It's certainly the next step when you look at how programming has worked uh, through the ages. Um, you know, people have abstracted themselves more and more from the machine, yeah. and more closely toward uh, making sure that the business requirements they have for an application are put into the code. So if you start from like generation one of coding, uh, you know, people literally used to input bits, you know, flip switches on yeah. machine boards to make sure that the, pro the processors would execute certain commands. Um, and that was very low level because you had to know not just what you wanted to do and then translate it yourself into code, but you had to know the architecture you were working on, the processor, you know, you were working very closely with the hardware. Yeah. So you weren't abstracted at all from anything. You were legit flipping switches, making ones and zeros. Um, and then they came up with a great idea, the, the second generation, this um, assembly language mm. idea, which translated certain values that you used to flip in bits to certain uh, mnemonic words, things like move and things like jump, because it made sense, because uh, processors would do that. Processors yeah. do today move values from one register to another. They do jump from one memory address to another, stuff like that. Um, so a lot of that low level stuff was still kept, but now humans didn't have to write in ones and zeros. Instead, they would write these values as you know certain, let's say keywords. Yeah. It would still be very closely related to processors, but they would write uh, these values as something they could understand a bit more. Um, and then you know these pro uh, after they made these programs called assemblers, which would basically be kind of like uh, first compilers, if you will, that would translate things into binary again, right? Uh, but then came along the third generation of programming languages, which is where uh, you didn't have to work so closely with the machine anymore. You you ended up making these programs, compilers essentially, that would translate human-friendly code, things like C, things like C++. Yeah. Um, actually, a lot of the languages that we use today are third generation programming languages. Um, that would that would then you know compile to something else like binary code or maybe some intermediate um, virtual machine bytecode kind of like Java has um, that would completely remove the programmer from having to know the architecture they're working on. They would have to know anything about hardware like you know memory addresses, yeah. registers, uh, the exact you know values for something like things that you don't have to know things that you used to have to know to operate to program a computer you don't have to know anymore all you have to focus on are the business requirements right which is what they put a lot of emphasis on today when you're going to software development they're like okay uh you know we want you to know how to translate something called user stories that a client would have into code which makes sense like because as a programmer you don't have to deal with knowing you know the low level stuff anymore you you just have to deal with making the application work and do what the client wants yes um so that's kind of where we're at today. There is something called fourth and fifth per generation programming languages, but that's not really, um, well actually, fourth generation is kind of like a build up, it's kind of like a 3.5 okay. uh, on the third generation, because it's not so much of an abstraction as it is a specialization into working with either AI or um, maybe some kind of modeling languages. Um, it's not so much coding as it is scripting, but I'm also not very familiar with that, so I don't want to say a lot of things. Um, the little bit of knowledge that I do have from the topic I looked into is, because um, it's an interesting topic, it's a field of science, yeah. and it is something that's going to keep evolving, um, and for example, fifth, to get back to the generations, the fifth and the final generation uh, programming languages today um, are some programming languages like Prolog and I can't remember more, but uh, but um, they are you're able to write constraints in Prolog, so you're actually able to do some things like set up rules, okay. and then it would it would um, check certain code or certain algorithms for you, 
and see if they are correct. And, and through that, uh, people use it to do some theory proving. Like there's, in mathematics, there's a lot of theory proving yeah. that you can't really do by hand sometimes. You have to get a computer to do it. Um, and languages like Prolog are used for that. Um, so you can somewhat write constraints and then have a computer generate some code for you. It, it is possible. Um, but a lot of that work is still, it's a very hard problem and it's not perfected yet. And a lot of that work is still just done by humans because humans are the only things that can do it right now. But um, it begs the question, back to the AI thing, if we are able to you know, have someone tell us through a meeting or whatever, an email, what they want in an application and are eventually able to produce that application for them, then it goes to show that there is a way of doing these things, right? So if there's a way, there's a method. And if there's a method, there's certainly an algorithm or an AI could learn to do the same thing that we, right. we know. So I, I, In the I, long run. Exactly. So I would never, I'd never like to say that it's impossible, but I do see us going there. In fact, I do, you know, have this vision for a thing where programming would just be um, inputting very um, natural sentences into a machine and then getting a program back just because you'd get it instantly just because the computer would handle that for all you. those keywords yeah so basically you just you'd be the client in the the programmer would be eliminated from the picture because there's no need for him anymore right so just like there's no need today for knowing <clears throat> at least with these desktop applications there's no need for knowing the exact architecture of your processor to get a program running, yeah, um, there won't be a need in the future. I feel, or I can see a vision. <laughs> there won't be. A he sees a vision. <laughs> yeah, there won't be a need in the future for someone to know actual code. A machine or an AI a neural network would be able to generate that for you. Yeah. So I think there is something there. Maybe Amazing. something. Yeah. And you even combined it with the next question. Oh, I did. More or less. I mean, it was the evolution of programming. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so that is that is it. Yeah, I, I basically used that. You did two in one. That was really impressive. <laughs> Without having seen the question. Oh, well, you couldn't yeah. see it from here, probably. Mm. But that's actually all the questions I wrote down. I mean, it wasn't okay. that many, but yeah. Do you have any questions? Um, it's your one and only yeah, chance. Yeah, you mentioned. You mentioned. Uh, do you have uh, some code or something that you wanted me to? To go through, I don't know if that's... No, I don't have any code, okay. I think, that I want you to go through. It was more of a, <laughs> that was more I of a joke. I want you to see. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay. I just want you to check out my code. And yeah, 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 yeah. All right. No, at the moment, Fair. I have no code uh, at all to show. I mean, that's fine. I'm reading through my new book, Android mm -hmm. Studio 3.5 uh, Essentials. Plug, plug. <laughs> you can get it on Amazon or whatever it is. The thing I really hate, I ordered this book, yeah. and they have a newer version that's six months more up to date. Ah, uh, okay. And I don't know why I ordered the one six months older, when I could have had the cheaper? one that's up to... No, it's not cheaper at all. Ah, f okay. I paid maximum <laughs> price for the old one. Well, you're a real fan. I don't know what to say. I have no... I think I'm, I'm, I'm upset. I, I thought Amazon yeah, okay. made the mistake. But in my wish list, I got the one that's 3.6. I see. And the one I actually bought was 3.5. But that's just one version, right? Like It's, it's one version back... So there during that, that time, much no. of a difference. Okay. They just implemented a whole new architecture, I think. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Everything changed. Everything changed. Oh man, that's great. Look, we even, I mean, like in theory we did about an hour of podcasting. I didn't think it would go for so long, but yeah. you had some very descriptive uh, answers. Yeah, I, had some, I had some stories to tell. You had some good stories. Now we need to hope that we can even save this file. Can you stop it and then see how big it is? I was going to say we should like pause it half of the podcast and test it. Yeah, we, yeah. I mean. So if we click on... Oh,